Um, I'm Paul Finch. It's my pleasure to chair this afternoon's session, which is going to see, I suppose, some of the fruits of the conditions, problems and opportunities which we've had outlined this morning. Um, I must say, as I was listening to the speeches, a number of things uh, had echoes and resonances, and you could have taken chunks of what was said and thought, well, actually, this is a description of Britain rather than the Netherlands. Um, there is a, a headline figure uh, of housing required, which is supposed to shock us, uh, but then on investigation it turns out uh, that the figure is not very far short of what would normally be expected to achieve. And although our own headline figure, much discussed, of 4.4 million dwellings to be completed by the year 2016, actually if you take it over the time frame of the analysis, it comes to about 170,000 homes a year. That's not far short of uh, what we're normally doing. The remarks about the way in which there have been a, a, a change from um, a kind of collective planning oriented uh, and centrally directed system to one which was more individualized and market led, well that was certainly tried uh, in Britain uh, in the early years of Mrs. Thatcher when the planning system was turned on its head. Um, but even before her demise, there was a realization that this really wasn't going to work. And the idea of plan-led systems came back again, um, at least in theory. Here, uh, as in the Netherlands, the housing associations are big players, but the difference being um, that I think successive governments here have been reluctant to allow municipalities uh, to continue the um, monopoly position they held in respect of public housing and housing associations have become much more significant here but I think in a less creative way in the Netherlands in the sense that uh, it looked as though they were becoming the builders of last resort now recently some of the more innovative ideas about housing design in fact have been inspired by uh, some of the housing associations in London and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, they have looked towards Dutch models of design and construction so that within the not too distant future, there will be a kind of Anglo-Dutch uh, design axis uh, in relation to at least some of the uh, public housing which is being built here. Treating the housing dilemma on a national basis uh, is something that we used to do in Britain and I suppose um, the equivalent of uh, the Vinex program, the Vinex program, uh, in this country was taking place in the 1950s and 1960s in the form of new towns. And I think you could have drawn a map of Britain at that time uh, with those concentric circles which related to uh, older industrial areas which were to be centers of housing concentration, uh, which were to be mixed use and which were to point uh, to a way of thinking that we might live towards the end of the 20th century. The abandonment or the, the, the ending of that program, not its abandonment, but in a sense its completion, uh, seems to have left a void in Britain. Until very recently, we did not have um, a housing program which was interested uh, in design and production and location. What we had instead was a fiscal program in which the thrust of policy uh, was to do with uh, tax subsidies, which were to do with purchase. And of course, by definition, uh, most purchases of most housing is concerned with the old uh, and not with the new. So therefore, that point about uh, choosing the traditional uh, as a lifestyle in a kind of postmodern uh, sense, I'm going to be traditional this year. Um, in, in Britain, that could only be true if, as a kind of postmodern condition, if uh, you had the choice of having anything other than traditional design in your new housing. And until very recently, there has been no choice unless you decided to uh, design a building yourself or to commission an architect to design one for you. Uh, the designs were all traditional, and if you were going to have a traditional one, well, why buy, why buy a new one which had lower space standards uh, when you could buy a very, very nice old one um, where they still had ideas about volume as well as area uh, representing some idea of civilized living. But it struck me that the one really big difference um, between the Netherlands and ourselves in respect of the world of architecture is that in Britain with the decline of public sector uh, architect departments, uh, we stopped designing housing and the really large 
volume house builders, as, as they're described, again, until very recently, paid scant regard to notions of urbanity, uh, architecture, or planning. And therefore, when somebody like uh, Prince Charles made a proposition, I think probably the, the uh, only interesting proposition he's made about architecture in respect of the rethinking of the suburb to be attached to a town, uh, to, to be attached to Dorchester, um, where you challenged uh, the hegemony and the monopoly of the traffic engineer, uh, and you got the police to agree that um, you didn't actually need to ab allow for two fire engines going each way down the high street in case there was a fire at both one end of Poundbury and the other. <laughs> And there was a refuse collection going on, and oh my God, the streets have got to be 50 metres wide. This was all turned on its head, and this actually, in terms of a critique of what the volume house builders would normally do, uh, was savage. It also suggested that you did not have to uh, do what the volume house builders habitually have done, uh, which is to take an existing urban area, move out five miles, buy up farmland, and then plonk a huge development uh, an unvarigated development of, of tacky boxes uh, and then wait for the public sector to fill in the infrastructure. Well, there may be some room for uh, optimism now because those very same uh, volume builders are beginning to respond to what might be uh, the start of a national housing program, which has been prompted partly by um, the scare, illusory though it may be, about the number of dwellings we're going to have but in relation to that model of putting that one million houses into one space, uh, to the idea that if you took 4.4 million houses, uh, then you will be wiping out a huge chunk of glorious English countryside. Uh, so a combination of fear on the one hand on the part of the protectors of the countryside and a desire on the part of people like uh, Richard Rogers and I suppose sort of half uh, the kind of design community in Britain who think that something should happen because they love cities and not because they're frightened about what may happen to the countryside. As a result of this, we, we now have a proto-housing policy which is to, say, put between 60 and 70 percent of these new homes into existing uh, city boundaries but using uh, underused land uh, known as brownfield sites. Now, of course, the uh, Dutch have got an interesting version of the brownfield site, which is called water. It's a sort of, <coughs> it's a bluefield site. Um, it's considerably cheaper than a brownfield site because uh, although it will cost money to make the land, I mean, when you've got it, as somebody said this morning, uh, that land is free. Uh, where in Britain, brownfield sites usually have heavy contamination uh, brought about by an industry which has now been privatized and will have no intention of ever cleaning it up, but they will sell it uh, to the public sector for a handsome profit, which is what's happened down at uh, the Greenwich Peninsula. And I suppose as an experiment, I think all we can say about Greenwich is, well, let's hope it's good and let's do some more and let's see what we can learn from it, uh, because it's the first dramatic thing to happen to a sort of public-private uh, housing within the city, in, uh, certainly in London, uh, for several decades. Uh, I thought it's a wonderful uh, corrective one of the last contributions during discussion uh, to suddenly be informed that the Dutch are anti-urban, uh, which suddenly made me sit up and think, well, that's going to give us something to talk about over lunch. And I think that relates to ideas of, um, well, to what extent does the, the idea of the suburban and the urban, how can, they, how can they be separated out? I mean, if the core of the city didn't exist, would those suburbs be the city? Um, and one might think of uh, Detroit, uh, one might think of peripheral development where in fact uh, the suburbs with a little bit of a push, uh, say around the M25, the Ring Road of London, uh, if you put enough office parks and enough shopping centres so people no longer have to commute into the centre, uh, where is the city and where is the periphery? I mean, what begins to look more suburban? Uh, streets where people have facilities and places where they go to work. Uh, as opposed to uh, the centre of the city, which can be a repetitive bland buildings, whether industrial or residential, um, in, in which people uh, insist on having their own private parking. 
And I think that ambiguity about what really is urban, what it isn't, perhaps uh, will be something discussed this afternoon, as might be uh, density and the question of how one looks at density. I mean, that point that was raised about that, uh, that Britain doesn't have uh, mixed housing except by accident and when an area is going up or down. Of course, it depends where you draw the boundary where you're looking at. I mean, usually within, say, 500 metres, you can take a very rich area in London and you'll find a very poor area as well, and vice versa. And if you want to say, well, London is a mixed city, um, you can go to innumerable places half a mile from here and find millionaires and paupers uh, living, if not cheap by jowl, uh, then certainly street by street. And then that, in turn, uh, raises the question of if we're to provide um, a new model of mixture in which different social groups are to, to, to coexist, um, peaceful coexistence uh, in the same block, uh, then what is it that we're giving them which will distinguish their desires and their needs uh, without pointing out the fact that they're either rich or they're not rich? And we saw some examples earlier of attempts to give people their own, uh, their own identity uh, within blocks um, so that you've got um, uh, homogeneity uh, and difference at the same time, the same difference everywhere, as we used to say. Well, we've got three speakers this afternoon um, whose ideas, I'm sure, and whose examples uh, are going to take uh, this morning's events and arguments further and allow us a decent time at the end, starting at 4.30, for discussion. Um, our last speaker will be uh, Natalie DeVries, who I'll introduce properly um, after our break. Um, but our first two speakers, first is Kay's Chrissy Answer, and second is uh, Michelle, or... Michel um, uh, Riddijk, and I don't think they need uh, too much introduction, um, but uh, Kay's Christie answered a, a partner in OMA, a considerable reputation, published uh, worldwide, um, offices in two countries, uh, an academic, and the sort of architect actually you expect to come out of the Netherlands. Uh, they design, they lecture, uh, they travel, uh, they produce books all with, with an apparently uh, effortless ease, which I imagine comes from uh, 20 years of reasonable uh, social and economic growth in the Netherlands rather than the swings and roundabouts of our own dear country. Um, Michel Riddijk, um, well, he is an architect, it says on my prompt sheet, and he certainly is. He's in practice with uh, Van Neuslings, and uh, our own magazine just published a lovely little industrial scheme of theirs for a printing company um, specialising in high quality graphic printing. A beautiful idea of letters um, kind of stamped onto the external facade of the building, but not stopping there, but doing the work uh, in the best collaborative spirit with a poet, what else, when you're talking about words and letters. And if you care to circumnavigate the building, uh, you'll read a poem. But first, Case Christie answer. Thank you. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, um, before lunch, I uh, maybe uh, you remember that I indicated what uh, interests me. Maybe ca I can have that laser pointer too, or, or is it here? No. Um, that what in interests me about uh, suburbia is um, the fact um, that we uh, as uh, urban designers have to deal with it in a certain way. If we want as urban designers to, uh, to play a role in the, in the complex uh, processes that, uh, that make our country, that produce the uh, visual, that's really difficult. I'm sorry, but uh, this makes so much noise, you know. So, okay. Um, then, <coughs> then we uh, we have to deal uh, with these problems. And uh, what I th what I think is uh, is a positive aspect of uh, suburbia is uh, the f first of all that in the Netherlands uh, the uh, these average situation between the American uh, dream and the socialist I ideal uh, has been. Uh, realized more or less in the fact that everybody 
and literally everybody can afford himself uh, his own house if he wants to. Um, um, I think that is, a, as such, a very attractive uh, aspect of a kind of uh, exaggerated version of uh, democracy. And the second aspect is that we are living in an agglomeration of small cities that are very close to each other that has always been like that and in fact uh, is the uh, basis of the fact that Holland in the 17th century was the most metropolitan area uh, in, uh, in, the, in the sense of uh, trade and international contacts uh, in the world. Um, the, the aspect of uh, model, mobility, uh, the theory that uh, by means of uh, public transport and by means of uh, realizing the compact city, you would uh, uh, solve a lot of problems in the city is not true. And um, <coughs> I think in that, that those are, are, uh, are very important uh, aspects um, that, uh, that generate an interest from my side in uh, suburbia. And uh, moreover, uh, a very strange situation is that in the country where uh, the land should be uh, as scarce as possible because there are so many people, we have 15 million uh, inhabitants in a country that is about a tenth of England. Um, that uh, land is very cheap and that, in, in fact, in a lot of places, uh, agriculture uh, delivers so much land because agriculture is decreasing um, that uh, the land even becomes cheaper. And if land is not in, uh, being used anymore for agriculture, you can choose to, uh, to make it into a reservation, but you can also use it if people want uh, to live there. So, in other words, because uh, urban, urban design or uh, urban development has always been generated basically by socio-economic processes, I think uh, as, a, as an urban designer and an architect you should uh, deal with these uh, aspects and these problems. This slide which was already shown by Arnold shows uh, a small agglomeration, the city of Arnhem and the city of Nijmegen with the cities in between. This is the German border where the Rhine comes into the country and um, the city of Arnhem uh, is uh, um, happy to have one of the bigger Phoenix locations in the east of the country, which is this one here. There are some other ones. Here's one, and here's an area around uh, Nijmegen. Um, remarkably, these areas, uh, they are uh, for a large part, also the other uh, Phoenix areas in the country, are for a large part uh, being uh, placed on the map from a centralist uh, decision. There is some influence by uh, provinces and uh, local governments, but basically the Ministry of uh, Housing and Environment in The Hague, which is the central ministry for uh, the uh, spatial organization of the country, um, decides uh, where a, a development is being realized. So you have the paradoxical, paradoxical situation that in the country which is mostly, uh, has the most decentralized democratic system, uh, the uh, places where developments are being done are, are being uh, uh, decide, uh, decided on the highest level, which is also very interesting to talk about. So this area here, which is called Schuitgraaf, uh, uh, which is on the southern, uh, southwestern border of Arnhem, about 10 kilometers from the uh, medieval city center, uh, was appointed to become a Vinex location uh, and to house 7,000 uh, houses. This area is completely blocked from the city uh, by the railway Arnhem-Nijmegen. And um, also the relation uh, of the southern suburbs, which are uh, kind of uh, islands of uh, developments from the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s, um, have not really uh, a certain coherence and have nothing to do with, with each other. This whole area is a delta with meadows and polder which is flat countryside, farmland. And this area is uh, uh, so even a little bit hilly, which is very peculiar for us, and has forests, and is the most attractive part of the city. So the poorer extensions and the, the later extensions, when space was uh, finished here, were done, done here, and the latest extension is going to be put here. Um, there are a lot of questions why you wouldn't put it here, here, there, or there, because these places are all vacant. But it is also a question of uh, kind of negotiation between municipalities of uh, um, surrounding villages, and um, also a question of uh, whether you are able uh, to 
um, be, uh, to get the land in a considerable uh, time uh, as, a, as a council into property. So this area is part of the so-called Betuwe, which is the fruit uh, planting area in Holland where you uh, can get apples and uh, strawberries. Um, and it's a very beautiful landscape of uh, schoolises and dikes and ditches and um, willow trees and poplar trees. Um, was appointed to house 7,000 housing units, which is a kind of uh, indication um, of the capacity such an area should have. Um, with an average of uh, about 28 uh, dwellings per hectare in an, a relation between 30% uh, social housing, 70% um, uh, 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 private housing, which is a big change in relation to 20 years before. And uh, of these 30%, um, about uh, the half is uh, being uh, in uh, apartments and the rest is completely flat. Um, I'm not mentioning uh, the program uh, of uh, functions like schools, uh, shopping centers, um, office, uh, or other uh, aspects, because in this whole uh, way uh, of thinking of uh, VNEX development, the housing plays the most important role, and all the other aspects, um, the aspects which should have a kind of uh, important functions in terms of mixing uh, and in, uh, introducing a, a certain uh, way of uh, of uh, centrality and um, uh, urbanity are uh, mostly uh, not discussed before uh, a scheme is realized. So uh, in a way one talks about uh, where can the people live and then after that one starts to think about all the functions that should be added to it. Can I have the next slide? This is uh, the area and um, as it is a very beautiful farmland, um, we were thinking um, 7,000 houses, we, this is a big problem and first of all it's a monoculture and second of all um, one is used to make a fixed scheme um, and when the fixed scheme is not realized there is an enormous amount of scheme uh, infrastructure being realized but it is not being filled and we were already anticipating on the tendency which uh, uh, slowly appears to become true now, uh, and a tendency uh, that indicates that all these Phoenix locations will eventually not be built uh, to their uh, completion because now the, the, the um, uh, request uh, for housing is uh, a little bit uh, going down and the expectation is that it uh, continues. So we, were, uh, we designed uh, a scheme in which, which was a kind of uh, uh, butter cheese egg uh, play in which we said um, Places are going to be not be built, places can be half be built, places can be fully be built, places can be uh, forest or other green, places can be water. Um, next slide. And we, we decided uh, to make a scheme in which the underlying uh, parcellation uh, in the whole area, here's the railway, um, was the base for a development um, in which uh, clusters, enclaves of uh, development uh, would be uh, built, um, surrounded by uh, the uh, landscape that would stay intact, including all uh, trees, dikes, hedges, uh, farms, etc. Um, and we divided uh, the built areas in uh, a high density area near the place where a station on that railroad is going to be. Um, we divided it into uh, these orange uh, fields that were be to become islands of uh, approximately six to eight hundred uh, dwellings, and we div divided it into these yellow fields, which were low dense uh, band developments or uh, freestanding building uh, developments uh, that have uh, domin uh, dominantly a green aspect. The empty space we divided in the meadowland that uh, would be uh, maintained the uh, different forests and uh, fruit plantages that would be maintained. Uh, some of the uh, areas would be turned into water by taking the sand out. And the sand would be used to partially uh, level out uh, the areas to be built because we have always uh, to, to, to bring sand onto, onto the land because otherwise uh, we are uh, having wet feet in our living rooms. Um, so mostly we have a layer of one and a half meters of sand putting on top uh, of, uh, of the soil. And what mo mostly happens in these cities extensions is that uh, people, because that's the cheapest, 
they completely bulldoze such an area, and then they uh, they uh, smear like uh, peanut butter uh, this sand uh, across the area, uh, erasing all the traces that were there, and then start to design a kind of nice uh, circle or uh, eight form or whatever, um, and that's then the new neighborhood. And um, the problem with that is that as you erase all traces, there's nothing left of a kind of uh, depth in the in the area. And um, also the problem of these areas is that uh, they are not flexible because they are uh, being bulldozed in, uh, in one uh, action and therefore cannot be phased. You can phase them, but then you keep uh, a certain amount of uh, desert um, left. So what we proposed is to only uh, to take sand out uh, and therefore create a water system of canals that can be also be used as a recre recreational um, circuit and use the sand to partially uh, level out these areas and uh, the meadows in between, uh, they were kept intact. And also they have to very carefully leave all the tree rows, etc., intact. So you get a kind of a grid, a raster of, uh, of, of landscape rooms in which uh, this uh, plan is going to be uh, developed. And one of the virtues of it then is that it doesn't matter if you realize 100 uh, houses or if you realize 7,000 houses. Um, because at all, in all phases, uh, the scheme is completed, which means you, did, you do not destroy the landscape by anticipating on, an, on a large sit, uh, town extension, but you can uh, develop a model in which you gradually fill it in according to the request uh, of the situation, which means that also the time in which it's going to be developed can be very long but can, can be very short, and this is increasing the level of, de of depth um, in relation also to tree growth and things like that in that area. Next one. So um, this is uh, the uh, image that we have from the area when they start building. So all these uh, farms, some of the farmers want to stay there. Others, they already sold their uh, estates to um, project developers. And um, if, if that is the case, then uh, these buildings are going to be filled with schools or community centers or other uh, or even people who want to live there uh, in the area so that this kind of historical uh, depth is going to stay there. And um, the tree, uh, the fruit tree uh, areas and uh, meadows are being maintained inside uh, the area for a large part. And they are going to be uh, economically exploited by schools, um, children's uh, uh, farms, and um, by uh, certain, for instance, uh, horse riding uh, clubs that are uh, renting a piece of land for the grass. That is a kind of low-tech system that can, uh, that can be exploitable uh, for the council uh, without having expensive parks to be uh, introduced. So you see also here that all the tree rows, etc., are being kept, and that uh, this means that these uh, islands of housing, these villages of housing, are going to uh, be put into these uh, rooms of landscape. The next one. Here's another one, existing ditches, where we carefully uh, decide where borders are going to be of build volume. Next one. Next one. And here's an, uh, an example of such a water area that uh, is going to be uh, taken out. The sand is going to be taken out. Next one. So here are some examples of how these uh, islands are going to be developed. This is an island uh, which um, is an, an area of uh, around 55 dwellings per hectare. This is an area of about uh, 25 uh, um, housing per hectare, and this is uh, 15 uh, uh, dwellings per hectare. Um, you may ask how we do this, um, because normally you have a certain exploitation or, uh, division in which you have to sell so much land and the houses have to have a certain parcellation size, um, which means that you, uh, if you want uh, real investors and project developers to do such a scheme, um, you must comply with their market uh, figures. Because if you uh, make a scheme where uh, there's a lot of density which is not uh, to be sold or there is uh, an enormous amount of uh, land uh, empty so that the whole exploitation of the area doesn't uh, fit in relation to infrastructure, you can do it. So what these uh, neighborhoods uh, uh, are is that, next one, 
um, we uh, compress the density uh, of the average uh, uh, amount of housing per hectare. So for instance, if the average of the total area is 28 houses per hectare, we make these garden estate neighborhoods of 55 houses uh, per hectare. Um, and we make the uh, central part where the station is of, for instance, 60 to 80 housing, uh, houses per hectare. And in that way, we increase the density in the residential areas in such a way that without making the parcellations of the, res of the dwellings themselves smaller, because that will be not possible economically, um, the surface of these areas is uh, considerably decreased. And uh, the next step is to throw out all um, superfluous green stuff, the dog shitting strips, um, uh, playgrounds, etc., and allocate the surface that you throw out to the existing uh, landscape that, uh, that is around it. And in such a way, you are able to comprise, to, comp uh, to comprime um, the surface of a uh, residential area and keep a considerable amount of landscape free. Next one. So you see an, a few examples of elaboration of these uh, uh, areas. This is, for instance, uh, a village of uh, 55 dwellings per hectare. And it has a very idiosyncratic uh, shape in the sense that it is really like an Iranian carpet um, uh, in, the, uh, in the space. So it is a kind of contained uh, village in this landscape with a real central square and the central access road and bus uh, line is going through it and all the uh, houses are grouped uh, around it. For these three areas of densities, of which this one is the middle, we have also different rules for architects uh, and for uh, building uh, programs for developers. For instance, these villages, we would like to make real garden villages. So the architecture is uh, being put into a regulation uh, of a kind of modernist tradition of 1930s uh, garden cities. Next one. Whereas uh, the, um, this one is the same. Next one. And here you have an image of it. Next one. Next one. <coughs> Whereas uh, the uh, low dense areas where the buildings are standing in the green, uh, we call the uh, desperado areas. Uh, this, these are areas that are dominated by the green, uh, by certain regulations, and the architecture is completely free as long as the buildings are standing in the, uh, in the middle of, uh, of each plot. And um, the central area, which is this area, high density area near the station, again, is uh, very programmed in the sense that street patterns and uh, elevations are very, uh, very fixed. Because of the, so you get, uh, you get a very uh, different elaboration of the different uh, aspects of uh, density in that, uh, air, in that big area. The, the problem of programming in uh, such, a, such a place is the uh, monoculture of uh, housing. Um, and um, of course we are uh, trying to do with very little means, we are trying to shift the border between uh, pure housing and, uh, and other uh, aspects. And uh, one example is, for instance, the body of Spornberg scheme uh, by uh, Adrian Geuze in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam. Um, where you see here a carport, which is uh, part of the house. The carport is, uh, has an uh, obligatory height of 3 meters 20 um, and uh, can be turned into uh, a working space so that you can make a kind of a shop or a workshop or uh, an architecture firm, one man architecture firm. Um, into your house so that the ground uh, floor area is um, activated when, an, uh, when such a neighborhood is in that course of time being uh, more lively. So in order to, we try to, to prescribe for architects certain uh, flexible building types in which uh, urban, the mixing of urban functions can uh, increase uh, during the lifetime of the neighborhood, although on the moment that we start realizing it, it's not possible. Next one. Um, now I'll show you how uh, such a neighborhood is going to be built or being filled in on another scheme. This is the uh, scheme of Leidserrein near Utrecht, which is an area where 30,000 dwellings are being realized. Um, and in this uh, huge uh, master plan, um, we are uh, designing this area uh, in two parts. This is the first part and this is the second part. And Fritz Palmboom is doing this area here. Um, and um, the next one, please. 
uh, it looks like uh, like this here. This is the River Rhine, the old River Rhine, not the new, the, the recent one. And this is uh, uh, a very uh, nice bent road with farms. And in between there is a kind of strip uh, landscape typology of uh, meadowland. So this is, here you see the uh, perimeter of the city of Utrecht, and this will be uh, an enormous, uh, I think you can't call it a suburb any anymore. It will be a self-centered uh, fragment in the conglomeration of Utrecht. Um, and we are realis realizing the first area here on a kind of uh, arbitrary spot. And the only reason that we were starting at this point is that uh, the land that is on this area was firstly bought by the council. Uh, so you also have kind of, uh, this is an illustration of a process that you absolutely have no control uh, on a kind of harmonious growth of the city, but that certain other factors are, def are defining where you start with the development, which uh, is a confirmation of uh, the fact that you have to develop such a strategic uh, way of, uh, of planning. Next one. You see the scheme that we made. We made uh, uh, um, the main uh, access road uh, of uh, the whole area. We pushed uh, from the middle in which it was prescribed to the north uh, and made a swing in it so that it became a kind of uh, complementary band to the northern uh, band. This was partly inspired by uh, Fritz Palmbaum's scheme for uh, Prinsenland in Rotterdam. And then the south area uh, we left uh, to uh, a large suburban uh, shape, and this would be the kind of uh, um, conflict growth area, as we call it. You see that uh, the area is uh, moving uh, between two bands of uh, farm strip, and what we did is we took the landscape, and uh, here you see indicated the maximum amount of, uh, of infill that is uh, tolerable, um, which means that we developed a system of uh, building zones, uh, which are alternately uh, on one side uh, having an access road and on the other side a free uh, landscape area. Uh, they're maximum uh, 60 meters wide, which means that if you uh, walk from the middle to a green spot, uh, you are also always uh, within 50 meters uh, in a large uh, free space where you can have a, a reference to historical uh, lines in the landscape. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this scheme is that uh, these zones we uh, fixed um, in terms of service and in terms of uh, program, and then we developed a whole set of building rules, but we did not uh, develop a layout for the blocks uh, of the architects, and uh, neither did we develop a layout for the streets. So even the streets in between uh, are, uh, are being developed by developers and their architects, um, and therefore they develop, by definition, collective spaces that are semi-public and therefore, uh, by definition, a kind of uh, experiment in the relation between pi private and public uh, was generated. Um, the next. So um, you could, for instance, uh, this is the access street, uh, make a housing on the street and housing on the green with a kind of public space in the middle with gardens, or you make, could make a courtyard between the green and the street. All kinds of stuff uh, were uh, possible. Next. And. Uh, there were some factors uh, that we defined. For instance, that on the roadside, uh, the entrance to the uh, estate would be uh, stone, uh, stone uh, uh, fences uh, that had a certain uh, transparency. And on the other side, on the green, uh, it would be uh, in uh, hedges, in the form of hedges. And there would be a kind of uh, transparency factor that would allow uh, a view between the street and the green uh, of 20% in rhythm along the whole uh, length of the building uh, zone. In the on the horizon, you see the next building zone. Next one. You see uh, what kind of rules uh, we developed. We gave them the surface of the site. We gave them the amount of dwellings. We gave them the differentiation in uh, what prices and categories they were. Um, we had some uh, <coughs> special things like uh, an infrastructural aspect uh, in the site. Then we had a rule for the height and the roof. Uh, we had uh, rules for entries. Uh, one access per 50 meters for cars, one per 25 meters for uh, paths between the residential areas. We had uh, a transparency factor. We had rules for, for instance, uh, end houses. 
you are not allowed to make an end house with a blind wall. You have to turn it 90 degrees or you have to introduce a front door into the elevation or you have to uh, make 30% glass. There are all kinds of uh, rules for um, the transition public-private. And um, last but not least, we had a kind of spectrum of materials and colors that architects should uh, comply to. These rules, uh, by the way, vary according to the specific uh, urban, urban scheme that we make. Next one. And so you see here, you see the definitive uh, urban uh, design, which is now under construction. Um, and you see that we get a kind of uh, layout in which there's an enormous amount of coherence. Uh, although we didn't define any of these building uh, uh, volumes or the layouts of these uh, things themselves. We only mediated, uh, we, 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 we steered them a little bit. So for instance, here we see uh, a zone that has been filled in like a kind of a pueblo, um, a kind of patio wall uh, around which uh, there is a square or in, uh, in which there's a square. Uh, around the square there are private gardens from the private gardens, there are the entrances to the houses, and the houses, they uh, stand on a perimeter wall uh, on, the, uh, on the outside. This is being repeated three times. Um, and here on the other side, you see a completely different scheme with conical uh, courtyards, conical mews, uh, in between gardens that is by another architect. This, for instance, is by the architecture office of Meccano, and this one is by the architecture office of uh, Stuart Suters. So you see that this variety, um, is possible without uh, losing uh, coherence in the scheme. The next. Here you see the first uh, sketches of Meccano. So we gave these uh, guidelines, then they came with kind of uh, examples of how uh, houses could stand on the wall, uh, volumetric examples, uh, examples of how you could uh, fill in this courtyard, etc. Next. And here you see well, their scheme is just not on the slide, it's over here. Uh, next one. Here you see a, a few of their uh, elevations. I'm on purposely, I'm not showing the nice drawings that we and they, and they made, but the developer drawings that uh, on the basis of which the houses are, are being sold. Um, so you see here, uh, so to say, what in a sales brochure uh, of uh, a, a, an average Dutch uh, project developer, uh, modern architecture looks like. Next. Um, we have no, uh, we did not uh, do any, uh, any uh, prescription about uh, roof uh, or roof shape, so sometimes this happened. This is going, uh, this is being uh, developed by uh, a very, uh, one of the most famous high-tech uh, folding uh, Amubi architects in Holland, uh, Kaas Oosterhuis. He, he made this, uh, uh, this p pavilion in Zealand, maybe you know it, this computer uh, uh, pavilion on a uh, water ha household in, uh, in the Netherlands. But you see that he, uh, he uh, very nicely can adapt even to, uh, to uh, uh, clay tablets uh, on the roof. Um, next one. Um, we are now currently working on, uh, on this area here, but I would like to stress uh, once more this. Uh, access road. Um, we have a very strange uh, law in Holland, which is the law on uh, sound, uh, on sound uh, protection. Um, and this law on sound protection was being uh, introduced uh, in the 1980s and then fixed and made a law. And uh, it's uh, the one of the f one of the virtues of that law is that you cannot produce any urban street in in, uh, in the whole of the Netherlands anymore, because. Um, if you uh, want to place uh, live activities in buildings uh, on a street that is at the same time a traffic access street, which we all like, of course, like um, uh, the high streets in Toronto, for instance, which is a very low-rise area but very urban. Uh, Queen Street in Toronto is a very good example. Um, then you uh, either are... Uh, uh, you should make buildings that have no windows or have windows that cannot open, um, or the buildings are so standing so far on the horizon that the street becomes a kind of uh, lonely desert, or you have to build a kind of uh, transparent screen in which the buildings behind it are standing like uh, in an aquarium. Um, 
which of course is, is uh, very uh, problematic because all the politicians in Holland now want urban streets uh, because that is uh, what people think is human um, and lively uh, and all the developers are drawing it in perspectives although it is not possible for the law to realize it. So how to solve this dilemma? Um, we thought to solve this dilemma by uh, making a normal uh, uh, high-speed road and by uh, making our accomplice the uh, traffic uh, calculator who uh, reduces the amount of uh, cars uh, as much as possible in, our, in, in the kind of ideological calculation that we have to do for the government so that uh, the sound intensity that's coming out of the calculations is as low as possible. Um, and then uh, we make uh, all the program in the, uh, in the buildings that stand on the side of the road here. Um, we make, uh, there's, nam there's namely one uh, hole in the law in Holland, that is uh, when you make uh, a corridor or something like that, you can call that an undefined space um, and it uh, doesn't have to comply with the sleep uh, bedroom uh, regulations and it doesn't have to comply with uh, living room com uh, regulations. So we made all the living rooms and, and bedrooms uh, on this side, we made undefined spaces that are three and a half meters high which means that they can now, uh, for the time being, uh, being used by the inhabitants uh, at will, but officially they are not living rooms. Um, and in the course of the time when this, uh, when this uh, street is going to be more uh, intensified, uh, they can change it into shops uh, or into uh, offices <coughs> or into other kinds uh, of program. So in fact, we make a simulation of an old provincial road between two towns in which the farms uh, are gradually uh, uh, replaced by tanks, uh, gas stations, uh, by uh, garden centers, and etc. So that you get an, uh, a, a car accommodated urbanity, which I also like quite a lot, as you may have uh, concluded out of my uh, talk, um, which is uh, a much better alternative than to make an urban street which doesn't uh, ever work as an urban street. So that's the framework on, on the basis of which this uh, scheme is being developed. And the first uh, set will be ready in about a year here. And the second set will be uh, in three years uh, finished. It's next. Here we see the, uh, the layout of the, of the second scheme, uh, one of which is uh, done by uh, Gerald McGrainer. I don't even know which one, but uh, maybe he can point that out. Is this it? Yeah, that one. This is the one. Okay, thank you very much. How do the slides work? Where can I uh, organize the slides? These, these two buttons. Okay. Do you have a short pause? Or no? Yeah. Are you ready? Two machines, actually. The, the 
Probably it isn't on because the, no, the other one. Yeah, this is better. Okay, uh, I have the difficult task to show you finally some housing because we've we've been talking about housing for the whole day already, <coughs> and I have also the difficult task to talk about low-rise housing. When I, when I arrived here, I, I uh, came. Uh, I had the surprise, uh, the, the surprising uh, uh, idea that I never did a lecture on housing before, because in general uh, we we don't do uh, lectures on such a specific topic as housing. But apparently here in uh, in London, that's a topic uh, worthwhile uh, discussing. So I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm trying to show you four housing projects within one, half an hour. They're very different. Uh, one is a, a social housing project. One is a rather expensive housing project for sale. Another housing project is a kind of uh, uh, low rise, high density housing project. And the first housing project I'm going to show is a low-rise, high-density housing project uh, with very cheap houses or not so expensive houses for sale. The average price of a house of the first scheme I'm going to show you is something like 50,000 pounds. And the average area of the houses are something like 100 up to 110 square meters. So uh, first, some other introductionary uh, remarks. Um, this is uh, the Randstad, so the most of the project are, are in this uh, area. Um, this kind of uh, ghastly uh, map is a typical map which organizes the planning uh, procedures in Holland. For instance, the first project I'm going to show you is situated here, and the municipality who uh, is organizing that project just enlarged this kind of large uh, line on their copy machine and while enlarging it, the, 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 line, the, the line, the border between the preservation area and the boarding border between the, the non-preservation area became so big that within this border they projected uh, three, uh, three and a half thousand houses. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we make planning procedures work in Holland. Um, let's try the slides. Okay, let's say, what is urbanity all about? We had a long discussion about, about uh, the, the difference between urban and suburban um, areas in Holland. I think it's quite an unproductive uh, description because uh, at this time we live, in, especially in the Ransat, in such an interesting area that you can't speak from, of a, a difference between urban and non-urban areas, but because it's as, as the analysis of our office said, it's a patchwork metropole with, uh, within a very compact area, a lot of different qualities and a lot of different living environments. So this and the previous slides are within 20 kilometers from each other away. Another remark as an introduction is the fact that in Holland, um, or as an architect, you always have to work on your intuition because in general, every intervention you're doing is an intervention within something you don't know yet. For instance, if you're uh, designing um, a, a printing factory, you have to trust on your intuition and you have to trust the givens as being uh, described by your client. The interesting thing which with housing is that, first of all, you've got so-called professional clients. <coughs> These people that are people who know everything about housing, or at least they claim that they know everything about housing. And secondly, housing is a very uh, delicate matter because it's the, one of the only areas within the architectural field 
in which you have a lot of experience because in general I can speak for almost 99% of the people uh, lived in a house, has experience in a house, has uh, memories connected to houses. So it's uh, a very particular area in our profession due to the fact that we um, have such a common experience in it. Good. This meadow uh, was to be altered in a, in a high density uh, living area in a neighborhood of 150 houses uh, with a density of 60 dwellings a hectare. And it was, as, as I said pre previously, it, the task was, the commission was to make uh, rather cheap houses. And I'm going to show you a few techniques or a few things you could think about in order to um, make the budget, budget work. Um, these are two slides of the, the area or of the, the, the final design model. The idea was as follows. Uh, normally in uh, row housing in Holland you have, when it's uh, cheap houses, you have a, a base size of four and a half meter. And what we did, instead of making a house with a base size of four and a half meter with a car of your neighbors parked in front of your house and a, and a back garden, we, uh, we changed, we altered the scheme and we made, as we call it, court houses with a base size of nine meters. And due to that, we were able to make, uh, we were able to compress the traditional uh, road, car park, houses, backyard, backyard, houses, car park scheme into a more, compa more compact and a more dense scheme. Within this dense scheme, we cut out some uh, spaces, like uh, a central square here, uh, an area that opens up to, uh, to the meadows, the existing meadows, uh, another kind of square here. And we organized all these houses around central courts. These central courts are uh, areas without cars, with a road with a very small, small profile um, where all the houses are uh, looking on. I don't know whether that's new collectivity, but it's just a way of uh, creating spatial differentiation. So you see the scheme here again. So the interesting thing is it's, it's a res uh, we recycled the old back-to-back -back scheme. Uh, in, in, in England, probably that's associated with tuberculosis and uh, rickets. But <laughs> Uh, we, due to uh, modern ventilation techniques and due to the fact that you have a nine meter span and uh, uh, six meters depth of the house, the association with rickets and tuberculosis isn't not of the 20th century anymore. So what you see is you get these kind of small, <coughs> small courts where the houses are uh, orientated around. You get kind of special types. <coughs> As to, in order to end the court uh, and to make uh, a border to, uh, to the surroundings. What's interesting is that all the, all the parking areas are situated on private ground, either as a, an indoor uh, car park or as a car park within your, within your garden. Uh, due to that, you get different, different ways of living and different uh, atmospheres for living. So these people live live on the first floor with a large exterior terrace. These people live on ground with a nine meter wide uh, living room adjacent to that. Oh, where's this one? Uh, so you get, you get the plan. What's in, uh, hmm. this one doesn't work, does it? You see the building technique. What's interesting is that in order to keep it uh, to try to make a very cheap dwelling, it's, built, it's being built out of uh, prefabricated blocks. So the floors are prefabricated concrete hollow core slabs. And uh, the load-bearing walls are also prefabricated stone elements. They're dilatated in order to, to uh, keep, uh, to avoid uh, noise uh, problems, etc. But the, the, the funny thing is that due to that, you have a, due to this free span, 
you are able to uh, make a house that could be arranged in whatever way you want it to be arranged. So you can imagine you can have a house with just nine meter span and six meter depth on either floor, or you can make um, you, or you can you can make uh, just a house in it. Uh, I'll show you. The, can't we go? Oh, can't we go back? Can we? Oh, reverse. So you see that here. So either you, you divide it in rooms and uh, then you have a four a four room apartment or you uh, take these walls out or they aren't built by the contractor and you have uh, just a, a big house. So these are a few impressions. So the small street, the gardens adjacent to it, the, the central square. Uh, other types with, um, how do you call it, commercial areas integrated in order to have a, a small barber or, or a dentist or whatever, or uh, how do you call it, uh, a pharmacist in your neighborhood. I, li I like this slide with the dog. This is kind of uh, <laughs> living in Holland. And I actually, I like this one also as well. Herman Hatchberger always had stories about this kind of <laughs> interrelationships. <laughs> um, right, so uh, a second scheme is uh, within the Adrian Geuze scheme for Borneo Sporenburg. We, we, we do uh, this, this black area. It's being phased into uh, building streams. So this part is executed, these houses on uh, facing the river are under execution now. The idea is that you um, again make a dif different types of housing uh, in order to accommodate different living atmospheres and also in order to accommodate different ways of living. So due to the high density within this scheme um, we, we were facing uh, the, the question of uh, private uh, private atmosphere. So how, do, how can you uh, create a private atmosphere or how can you create privacy within such a high density and within a low rise scheme? Because imagining having one elevator and <coughs> floors uh, stacked onto that elevator, it's quite easy to create privacy because every dwelling is, st is stuck, to a st stuck, to a st stuck to a floor level but within uh, low-rise high density that's different. So what we did is we created three types uh, with all an entrance on the, on the street level. So you got the blue type, the yellow type, the red type, of course. Um, the yellow type uh, works, uh, enters below and has a double bay here and sleeping rooms and a garden uh, on the back of it. The red type uh, has sleeping rooms here, enters on the first floor of her, and goes over and has their living rooms and a large terrace adjacent to that. The blue uh, type, which you can't see, is, consists out of two elements. That is a, a, small or a small stone box as a winter house, and uh, adjacent to that, a glass box as a summer house or as an extension to, to your house. No, you, ah, this is better. Um, so th these are uh, carports, so you enter here with your car or with your bike, you go up, you have your own garden. If you go up uh, in this side, <coughs> you have a large double bay uh, living room and uh, sleeping rooms. These people have uh, sleeping rooms here and a private balcony here. Uh, these people come here, have a, also a car park here and uh, probably here a, a working space. And they have a double bay floor here, where this part is glazed and this part is completely uh, introverted as, as the winter house. So you, in, on this level you see the big terrace as a private outdoor space directly connected to their living rooms, uh, separate kitchen, and the second level in the other type with a void here for the, the glassed part, the glazed part, and uh, sleeping rooms over there. 
So again, something about uh, building. I never show these slides, but due to the fact that I'm in London, I can show them without, uh, <laughs> without any problem, probably. Uh, so what is interesting about this, it's um, um, cost on site. It's, uh, this is a, a very uh, common way of construction, of constructing in Holland. It's so-called um, tunnel, ca tunnel casting. It's a system that is being developed in the late 50s and the early 60s in order to make mass production possible. Uh, so what you do, you, you have a prefabricated formwork and you cast uh, the, the concrete over it. Due to that, you have in one go, you have your load bearing system and your uh, sound insulation within the uh, several units is in one go being organized. Uh, this system is being closed with prefabricated uh, paneling with the insulation in it and with the windows already in it. And um, then the only, the only thing they have to do is to cover this, this with the skin. So then you get something like this. Okay, um, this is another scheme, it's social housing. Um, it's on a former army barracks uh, site in Gent, uh, along uh, the Schelde. Uh, what we did is we, we investigated the site and apparently on the site there was a, an old cloister. It's called the Begeinhof. And we, what we tried to do is to reinterpret the, to, to reinterpret the, the scheme of the cloister. So on one side you have this main uh, artery directly from the ring entering into the city, that's this uh, road. Uh, on the other hand you have this uh, former, you have this Begeinhof. So this Begeinhof has a very interesting quality as a living environment in the city. So you have a gate and you have a large communal green after, behind this gate and all the dwellings have a, a private entry on this green. Actually, showing this scheme is a bit fraudulent because it's in, in Ghent, and Ghent is in Belgium, and it's outside of the scope of Vinex, but I, probably nobody noticed, so I just tell, I just do whether, <laughs> whether, whether it's in, in, in Holland, but it's, it's also in the low countries, and they do speak Dutch there, so there's <laughs> a... Um, so what, it, what, what we did, we, we, dif we divided the, the program in two, two bars, along this green, so we, we made it uh, a central entrance and we created a large communal green where all the houses have a direct entry on. So you have this kind of small patios as an intermediate space between this, this collective space and your private house. <coughs> Secondly, you have within this, within this uh, game or within this shape, within this volume, you have all kinds of different outdoor spaces because what one of the major disadvantages of housing is is the fact that you get this kind of uh, dif this, this very stark difference between dwellings that are on grade and dwellings that are on top of it because in general uh, the dwellings that are on grade have a garden and in general the, the dwellings that are in the middle have a kind of narrow uh, tiny balcony and, and probably the, the, the the guys who live on the on the roof have a, have a, a skylight or something. So, but what we try to do is uh, create on every level an outdoor quality that has um, similar qualities as a, a great position. So, all these people have a large outdoor gardens on top of their lower neighbor. What is interesting about this scheme is the fact that we also try to use uh, the building technique or try to use the technique of repetition in order, in, in one, for one reason, in order to make uh, cheap low-cost housing. This is social housing. In other order, due to this very stark uh, repetition, you're able, in a way, to finance, to uh, uh, to uh, finance these expensive uh, roof terraces 
on top of uh, the lower dwellings. So you see it here, so you get a very um, strong repetition of uh, bays. Uh, you, we, we worked with a very uh, small base size, so this is uh, 380, 385 at least. So you get very long and narrow rooms. So due to that, you get a rather compact uh, building, but on top of that, you, you can create uh, dwellings that have a double base size or a triple base size and that have large uh, outdoor uh, uh, spaces. Yeah, there's foam and uh, thing uh, almost built. And here it's also almost built. So um, it, it is finished already, this project, but I, I hadn't any better slides. <laughs> but I'm in London, so, I, uh, <laughs> so it doesn't matter in a way. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so you got these outdoor spaces, you got <coughs> very slender outdoor spaces, you got wide outdoor spaces, you got kind of uh, towers, you got the small patios in front as an intermediate space between the green <coughs> and uh, the living areas. You got small patios in front of uh, your living rooms, you got larger patios. You got the gate. Um, the, the internal uh, court is being ended by a small kindergarten with, again, houses on top of it. So this whole internal court is, has uh, two functions. It works as a kind of quiet green within the city. Uh, and at the same time, children who, who, uh, who live here uh, can go to the kindergarten and uh, enjoy uh, this uh, quiet space within the city. The riverside, the street side. Go, the, the last scheme I'm <coughs> going to show is a scheme we did in Huizen. Actually, this, this is uh, near Amsterdam. Amsterdam is some, somewhere here. <laughs> or, no, no. This, so that, somewhere here, I guess. Um, the, the commission here was to, to make, uh, again, houses and also, again, low-rise housing. Um, it was a very particular site because it, you, it's uh, a large lake and a new polder in front of you, but at the same time, the, um, the lake and the polder are on the northern side and uh, the sun and the gardens are facing uh, south. So what we tried to do is uh, to develop uh, typologies in order to use the view and uh, on the northern side, but also to uh, gain maximum from the <coughs> sun from the southern side. Well, this is the site again. This is uh, for early sketch. Oh. Now this one is wrong. So, um, so what we did is we, we created a small harbor and uh, we, we the, the drawings on purpose on top because this, this is, if you want to look at it, but this is the lake again. This is uh, the beach, a small uh, harbor we've, we've been creating and this is the first phase I'm going to show to you now. This is a special block, uh, but it's with an elevator, so it's without w outside the scope of this uh, day. What we did is we uh, had a commissioner or a client who asked us to make um, typical Dutch row housing with a, a six meter bay. And what we did is we, we altered the scheme and we um, created 12 meters wide uh, panoramic dwellings within, within the same uh, system. So instead, in, instead of having uh, this kind of uh, staccato of uh, all uh, similar types, we created uh, a dwelling that could uh, gain from the view towards the north and the sun entering from the south. So what we did is we created a carport 
uh, with, with a small tower with uh, sleeping rooms and service areas in it. And you've got two, two living rooms that are, in a way, overlapping each other. And they have a southern view or southern sun in their kitchen and the possibility of making there a large outdoor space. And they have a panoramic view towards uh, the lake. So the outside is something like this. Zijn onscherp, ja, dat kan niet hoor. So what you have is a, is a, a, a dwelling with, uh, instead of this kind of, uh, how do you call it, oogklepper, you've got uh, 12 meters of uh, view uh, within the same kind of uh, uh, urban uh, layout. It's the backside, the sun falling through through the carport. <coughs> Streets opening up to the lake, the towers with the uh, sleeping rooms. I guess this is the last, uh, the, these are the last two slides. So, um, about, about what, uh, about uh, Vinex in general or about uh, designing and uh, constructing uh, housing in Holland in general. First of all, I already made a remark that all these things are done uh, group wise. So, you, there's never uh, the, the, the relationship between either an architect and a client and uh, a builder, but you have this kind of committees of, of urbanists, traffic engineers, uh, environmental specialists, um, the women advisory board who advises you uh, where the kitchen uh, should be. Uh, the uh, it, it's true. It's tr yeah, you never did a project in Holland, probably. <laughs> so, um, uh, Due, due to this uh, kind of difficult, uh, due to this uh, outrageous uh, constellation, uh, there are two uh, advantages. Uh, the, the first advantage is that the, everybody is, uh, on a certain moment, is committed to a plan. So, uh, due to that, uh, the municipality and um, uh, the, the developer and the contractor want, in, uh, at a certain moment, they really want to have the plan. So, that's an advantage of these large. Uh, uh, designing in committees. A major disadvantage is the fact that uh, w because you, you, everybody has a, a say about your design, uh, there's a tendency towards uh, the general average and the general average still in Holland is uh, row housing uh, in a row with a garden in front and a garden in the back. And it's quite a, quite a difficult task in order to uh, overcome that. Thank you very much.